There we go. So, okay. you know, you asked me to give a little bit of a um, uh, fairly basic uh, uh, overlook on brain tumor treatments. And, and this is going to be very, um, very uh, a, sort of a 64,000 foot look on this. So don't expect a lot of detail. But as you know, this is our common foe. This is our enemy, glioblastoma. Just the name of it just sounds uh, kind of horrific. And we've known for over 100 years that these tumors are, uh, are very heterogeneous. By heterogeneous, I mean they just uh, look in different spots and different slots. They look very different from each other. Uh, as you can see, these are the MRI scans. These are the MRI scans of the brain where contrast material is injected. And contrast material, when it gets into the brain, stays inside blood vessels. You know, these little squiggly things are blood vessels but it will extravasate out but it's almost like a river that's flooding uh, into the surrounding plains. It'll extravasate out in areas of tumor. And so we take this contrast extravasation as an indication that there's a tumor here, but you right. can see that the contrast is not, is not uniform. There's areas of necrosis or where the contrast doesn't come up. And we actually even know that there's probably tumor or all around this where the contrast does not come in through. So even radiologically, this tumor just shows this, uh, this very heterogeneous presence. And then when you look grossly at postmortem uh, autopsies, you know, this is a unfortunate patient with a glioblastoma and you can just see that here, you look like normal brain here, but here there's this mass that's hemorrhagic, it's got blood in it and it's gone across the, to the other side of the brain. And when the pathologist, even 100 years ago, looked at these slices uh, histologically, what they could see is this multiform in nature. In other words, this very heterogeneous, uh, you can just see that these cells, these little black dots are actually nuclei of cells. These cells all look different from each other. And there's areas where these cells actually, you don't find any and they're just dead tissue. And now we know even genetically, if we go and sequence the, the DNA of each one of these cells, Mm. There's various mutations that are sometimes can be very different from a cell year to a cell year. Mm. And so that is, that is this profound heterogeneity of these tumors. And the other thing about these tumors is that they're also fairly cold immunologically. In other words, the immune system is not, you don't find any immune cells. There are very few immune cells that are in here trying to reject these tumors, which is another problem in treating these, these cancers. As you know, the standard treatment for this tumor is to try to re resect or remove all that area that's um, that is uptaking contrast if you can clearly we want to do that as surgeons by not giving a patient a deficit so we try to do that we try to remove that if you can do that that that's really the first step in trying to get a good survival time and then uh roger stoop uh, over 15 years ago introduced this chemotherapy and radiation regimen uh, of radiation plus timozolomide followed by timozolomide alone. And, uh, and we also have other treatments that have been approved. So gliadel is, a, is, a, um, is a, a chemotherapy that you can implant in the tumor bed doing surgery, bevacizumab, bevastin, and then there's the tumor treating fields um, that have also been approved. And these are delivering alternate current into the tumor bed uh, by placing these pads on the scalp. Uh, so our goal is, you know, again, you have these tumors here. As you can see, this is an MRI scan all from a patient. These are just serial sections going up and down the, the head. You can see actually the eyeballs here, the eye right here, and here's the tumor. And mm -hmm. our goal is after we take this tumor out and give chemo radiation is to keep patients like this, where this tumor just does not come back. And you can see there's there's this whole year where the tumor was, and our goal is to keep this like this for years and years to come where the tumor does not come back. But unfortunately, it does come back. And I borrowed this slide from my uh, friend, Patrick Wen, and unfortunately it does come back. And when it comes back, that's when uh, people like Fabio, David Reardon, um, uh, Dan and others, we get together and we say, what do we do now? Yeah, so you can do more surgery, uh, there are now re-irradiation protocols where you can re-irradiate this area. 
Again, um, if you did not have these wafers the first time, maybe you can put them in the second time. Uh, more timozolomide, other drugs like lamustine or carmustine, bevacizumab plus lamustine. Again, if you did not have the too much eating fields, you can go back on that. But really, the plea here to you is clinical trials. We need to do mm -hmm. clinical trials because we just don't know how to cure these yet. And the only way we'll find out is from doing clinical trials. And so what clinical trials are there out there? And these are very general classes. And um, you know, so there are these targeted therapies where you're trying to target what's called a known molecular vulnerability in the tumor. We know that these tumors, for example, other tumor cells in there depend on some proteins called, some enzymes called kinases. Kinases basically are enzymes that are upregulate a lot of pathways that are involved with tumor division and tumor proliferation. And so there are a lot of kinase inhibitor trials that have been tested over, over time. Um, trying to target actually the supporting cast of the tumor. You know that these we know that these tumors depend on blood vessels. Uh, we know that these tumors depend on other cells in there like myeloid device suppressor cells to keep them growing. So can we target those? And there are trials that try to target the supporting cast, hoping that if you destroy the supporting cast then the tumor becomes more amenable to treatment. There, there are treatments that are trying to target the metabolism of the tumor. In other words, the nutrition and the things that tumor does to try to, um, to try to grow. And you know, for example, the ketogenic diet is something that targets metabolism. Um, trying to target uh, the fact that uh, these cells, as they divide, also have to repair their DNA because during the process of cell division, you'll always have some DNA damage. And we also give DNA damage agents. So trying to make sure that the tumor does not repair its DNA and dies off is also uh, something that's tried. And then we start getting to the immunotherapies, trying to stimulate your immune system, trying to get the immune system cells that are not uh, targeting the tumor, they're not going there, scouring through the tumor. So vaccines, oncolytic viruses, gene therapy uh, are being used, dendritic cell therapies, or also removing the breaks on the immune system. What we know is that these tumors try to keep your immune cells asleep uh, so that they don't know that you actually have a tumor. And that is the uh, goal of immune checkpoint inhibitors that worked really well with other cancers. Unfortunately, glioblastoma, they have not. But maybe, maybe they may be a potential for combining these with other things and maybe that will be the answer. Right. So, so I'm always asked, which one of these is the most promising? And I wish I could tell you. Uh, I think everything is promising. Clearly we all have our biases. I'm, I'm big on immunotherapy, but uh, you know, it may be that the, the answer comes from something else. And that is why we need clinical trials to test each one of these. And sometimes you can test one against the other to see which one is the most promising. But really the plea is to do more trials. And uh, this was a survey that was done by the National Brain Tumor Society. Uh, it was an online survey to detect, uh, to determine the level of knowledge, experience and perceptions of brain tumor patients and their caregivers uh, about participation in clinical trials. And what really, what the results of the survey showed is that we need more resources and decision support like what you're doing with our brain bank to enable us to really get more fully informed about the trials, treatment options. So there were 1,463 patients and caregivers uh, that responded, uh, almost half were patients, the other half were caregivers. And the results of the survey were a little bit um, disheartening. Um, on the question, did the medical provider discuss clinical trials? Only 42% of patients with glioblastoma knew about clinical trials or were informed by their medical team. 36% of the patient never discussed clinical trials with their provider. Mm -hmm. When you look at who participated in brain tumor clinical trials, here again, a disease for which we don't have a cure, only 21%, only one out of five patients is participating in clinical trial. And actually the GBM patients are the ones that participate the most, but the astrocytoma patients, only 18%, 12% of the oligodendroglioma patients, 
and less than 5% of meningioma patients. Uh, and again, when were these trials discussed? Again, only 20, less than 25% of patients were informed about clinical trials at the time of diagnosis. And so again, my plea to you and, um, and to anybody that's, that's involved in clinical trials is to help increase awareness. Um, we have this, you know, we have a new oncology society called Snell Society for New Oncology uh, that's trying to really um, uh, have the clinicians share information with their patients about trying to advance clinical trials and advance the research on clinical trials. And also how you share this information with your patients uh, is, is, and with your friends is important. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to give this little small presentation and, uh, and we're always here open for questions and, and hopefully providing answers. Thank you so much. Really interesting, huge. Yeah. Um,